Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alex White. I'm Director General here at the Institute of International and European Affairs and uh, delighted that you could join us uh, for this afternoon uh, webinar. Um, from the changing global geoeconomic conditions to the enormity of tackling uh, the climate crisis, Europe is facing enormous challenges. Since their inception during the Industrial Revolution, trade unions have sought to shape policy uh, uh, in times of tumult, uh, always uh, striving to ensure that the interests of workers are secured. We are delighted uh, to welcome this afternoon to the IIEA from, from Brussels, but nevertheless, welcome, more than welcome uh, to the IIEA, Esther Lynch, who is General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, to discuss her views on how European green industrial policy can shape Europe's success, to discuss the state of play on uh, EU social dialogue, and also how reaching the EU target of 80% of workers covered by a collective agreement uh, can lead to successful outcomes uh, for all. Um, so as I said, it's a webinar. Esther is going to speak to us for about 20 minutes uh, or so, give or take, and then we'll be able to have a QA and a um, with you, um, people watching and listening to us this afternoon. You can join that discussion using that Q&A function on Zoom, which everybody knows about at this stage, and you can send in your questions. We always encourage people to do that. If a question occurs to you, in the course of um, Esther's talk, send it in immediately. You don't have to wait until she's finished. And then we'll come to those questions um, once the, uh, we we'll say the initial uh, uh, presentation um, has finished. As I said, Esther Lynch is General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation. Previously, she was Deputy General Secretary of ETUC from 2019 to 2022, following four years as Confederal Secretary. She led then on social dialogue, collective bargaining and wage policy, trade union rights and gender equality. Ms Lynch has extensive trade union experience, as we all know, um, at Irish, European and international levels, um, starting out with her election as a shop steward in the 1980s. And before coming to the ETUC, she was the legislation and social affairs officer uh, with the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, which is, I think, when I first got to know um, Esther. Um, and I thought during that period, I know that she took part in negotiations on the National Social Partner Agreements. So, um, Esther, you're really welcome uh, this afternoon. And I'm going to hand the floor to you and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Alex, good afternoon, and I can't tell you how sorry I am that Storm Kieron kept me uh, here in Brussels, and don't let that quiet looking behind me fool you. It's full-blown uh, bad storm uh, here too, so I hope, hope everybody's safe, and we keep ourselves safer as well by doing it on online, but I still hope that it can be warm and, and informative in the discussion as well, so look forward to the questions and uh, look forward to hearing from 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 people too. One of my favourite moments from, uh, one of my favourite EU moments was when back in 2004, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions led the welcoming of the 10 new member states, uh, the workers from those member states to join the EU. And we did that in Taylor's Hall. Um, and, and, it, and it was a hugely special moment, um, both for the workers and for their trade unions to, to to, to join with the ETUC all together and to say we're, we're all part of this together and we're not going to be put against each other, that divide and conquer isn't the way forward for working people in Europe. And, and that really is, if you were to ask me what's the purpose of the ETUC, that really is the purpose of the ETUC, to bring together workers and their trade unions so that all of us succeed, um, not that one group of, of, of workers succeed over another, but so that we can all work together to succeed. And I think one of, one of, one of the important lessons from the history of that was there were three member states that immediately opened up their labour markets, the UK, Ireland and Sweden. And what Ireland and Sweden had that the UK didn't have was sectoral collective agreements. They had binding agreements, for example, construction and electrical contracting in Ireland. Um, 
were called at that time the REAs. And those collective agreements ensured that workers were free and welcome to come to Ireland, but that they would be paid the same as every other worker in the sector. The same was the case in Sweden. They then suffered a bit of damage um, in relation to the, the Laval and Viking, but still they managed to keep their collective agreements. On the other hand, the UK didn't have those sector agreements. And I think that that fed into the concern that workers in the UK had. And I think if you look at the contributing factors as to why working people uh, uh, lost confidence in the EU, it was because there wasn't sufficient protection in place for collective agreements to make sure that there wasn't competition, dangerous, ruinous competition on paying conditions, conditions of work. Um, that can be prevented by having sectoral agreements. And that's why in the new directive uh, on minimum wages and collective bargaining, to have fair wages throughout the European Union, to have wages coming up throughout, throughout the European Union, there is this emphasis on having 80% of workers covered by a collective agreement. And there's a strong push from all of the research um, coming from Eurofound in Ireland, uh, is that the way in which you get that level of coverage by a collective agreement is to have a strong infrastructure supporting sector uh, agreements. And I know that the Irish Congress of Trade Unions is working closely with IBEC to make sure that there is uh, in place in Ireland a robust uh, support for collective bargaining, whether it's access to the workplace to meet with the workers, to tell them, you know, here's, here's how collective bargaining works, uh, here's how the union works, but also to make sure that there is sector level uh, uh, appropriate systems in place for that too. The, um, uh, the ETUC is 50 years old this year as well. Um, and what was really great at our Congress that we held in Berlin was we welcomed into membership the unions from Ukraine and Moldova. And it was important that we do that because the discussions are now already beginning on enlargement as well. So where we see having uh, our uh, brothers and sisters in the trade unions workers in Ukraine being part of all of our discussions, all of the plans that we have in particular for the coming uh, period. The elections, the European elections will be taking uh, place soon. The ETUC has adopted 13 commitments that we're asking uh, for working people to make sure to vote for those candidates that support working with trade unions, that support our values and that will support the 13 commitments. And one of those is uh, I'd like to focus on in this uh, sh short presentation. And that's on the green transition, the just transition, and to have that supported by a European green industrial policy. Now, this is a time of both opportunity and challenge, exactly as Alex said, um, we have these uh, big challenges facing us and also we have a commitment to decarbonise, but we can't let the commitment to decarbonise end up in, in deindustrialisation. Instead, what we need to have is a smart plan of investments to guarantee that we can still that we still make things that would still Europe is still a great place to come and do business and Europe is a great place to work as well. So that's why uh, we are calling for a green, a European green industrial policy. The first and most important part of that policy has to be to focus on people. What we see in the discussion on competitiveness is all too often that it's about cost competitiveness. And not, and not enough attention is put onto the environment into which we want people to come and work, whether it's the cost of housing, whether it's childcare, whether it's schools, whether it's transport, 
whether it's um, the public services that, that are available that people need to rely on, that that enterprise needs to rely on, that all of that has to be part of the consideration of competitiveness, that ignoring all of that and only looking at cost competitiveness of a sector or of a particular uh, enterprise is, is to fail in the task that we're presented with at European level. Rather, what we need to have is to put people that people are not widgets, they, they, they live lives and competitiveness needs to make sure that all of those things um, are also part of the consideration. And quality jobs are part of the success uh, of a European industrial policy as well. Our research shows that those sectors that have uh, labour shortages pay 9% less than the sectors where there are not uh, labour shortages. So pay is part of the story. It's not just a lack of skills, for example, in in um, uh, hospitality or in hotels, um, but often that is following COVID, workers decided they weren't going back to that sector, that the hours were too long, the pressure was too much, the pay was too little. What was asked of them was just too much. And instead of, of what, what the, the approach needs to be to turn to see those jobs as jobs that can be turned into great jobs, good jobs, jobs on which you can bring up a family, jobs in which you can uh, have a secure future. And again, sector collective agreements can, are, are critically important to that. If you speak to anybody, uh, any of the CEOs from the renewable energy sector, they will, will, will tell you that they are struggling to find people with the skills. So, so there is also a skills gap in some sectors. Uh, we need to have, find one million extra people for the solar sector alone, whether it's to fix it, maintain it or run the grid. Uh, we need to have at least one million people found there. But the gap between workers wanted to take up this as a job and getting the training is too big. That's why it's critically important to have uh, the right to training as part of the uh, green industrial policy, as part of a just transition, the right to training is critically important. The research shows that 61% of workers in Europe have no control whatsoever over their working time. So even if there is a course on, they can't get the time off to go there. We also know that workers who most need the training don't get access to it. So we just need to now, in the next four years, have as a key priority to secure the right to training as a key component of the just transition. We had a year of skills. It was great. It had a wonderful target. But the missing piece was, was workers being able to get access to the training, to get paid time off for the training and to know what training they, they, they needed to succeed in their career in the future. That's why one of our key demands for the next four years is an EU directive for a just transition. That, that directive will have certain core components. We are saying that we need to have information for the anticipation of change, whether it's for the company or for your career. That it will have the right to training, to pay time off for the training. That redundancy will not be the first option that instead redeployment um, or, 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 or skills change uh, will be uh, provided as realistic options guaranteed to workers. What many um, people don't know, but I'm sure everybody here does, is that in the EU treaty, it provides that the social partners, the employers and the trade unions can come together and negotiate an agreement that can be adopted in the form of a directive. The ETUC believes that that formula is the ideal way to provide for a directive on a just transition. We're being very clear informally about that and we're being very clear formally about that. We would say that the best way to negotiate uh, and to the best way to devise the right policies, the best way to identify the implementation of those policies is uh, by negotiating them directly with employers and to have it adopted uh, as a form in the, in the form of a directive. We're very much, uh, though, uh, waiting uh, for uh, our employer counterparts uh, to 
to agree to come forward and discuss that with us. But let, let me make no mistake, it takes two to tango, but if the employers are not available for that discussion, we're already asking the political system uh, to put in place uh, a commitment that either through uh, the employer agreement being adopted as a directive, or if the employers are not available for that discussion, that through uh, uh, the commission coming forward with a directive, it being discussed by the parliament, the council, and through the ordinary procedure, one way or another, at the uh, in the in the very near future, workers will be able to rely on a right uh, to training to secure the just transition for them. Then finally, we won't be able to afford a just transition if we if member states are constrained on being able to make the investments available. And we're very concerned that there's a discussion happening uh, at EU level um, this very week um, and, and next week on the new economic governance rules. And if those new rules mean that member states will not be able to make the investments next year, the year after, and the coming years for the tr for a just transition, well, that kind of makes all of the discussion on policy pointless. And that's why we're being very clear that in the new economic governance rules, those investments must be treated differently to, than costs. The member states must be able to make uh, investments for the just transition and for um, and to meet all of the climate targets. That's an absolute essential element. But we want the investments to do more than just that. We want social conditionalities attached to those investments. And we can look for great inspiration to the Inflation Reduction Act uh, put forward um, under the Biden administration. The Inflation Reduction Act allows for tax credits and investments for companies to make the green transition, but it requires a collective agreement. It requires taking on apprentices. It requires investment in training of the workforce. And we need to do the same. We need to make sure that our money is working as hard to uh, secure, not just that the company can succeed, into the future, but also that the workforce and the community that it's based in can succeed into the future too. That's a better way of spending the money. So yes, we are fully supporting the demand for investments, but we, we are re we're saying that they need to come with social conditionalities, em employment of apprentices, investment and training in the workforce and coverage uh, by a collective agreement. And that rule can also be made to apply to all of public procurement. It can't be the case that public procurement goes to the lowest costs based on lower wages or worse terms and conditions. It must be the case that public procurement works hard to achieve the social outcomes that member states and that the EU has set. For example, the European Pillar of Social Rights. The achievement of the rights in the European Pillar of Social Rights should also be a condition for public procurement and those those companies that have a collective agreement that invest in the workforce they should be privileged when come time to decision about who gets the contract over those companies that don't have a collective agreement and that don't uh, 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 support the workforce to um to 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 improve uh, their terms and conditions then finally, just to say a little bit about EU uh, social dialogue, uh, we we welcomed when President von der Leyen in her State of the Union address announced next year under the Belgian presidency that there would be a Val du Chess summit. And the last Val du Chess was the summit that brought forward the uh, change in the EU treaty that guaranteed the role for trade unions and employers to have their agreements adopted at European level in the form of a directive. It would be really helpful if at this Val du Chess summit, we were in a position to set out a vision for the coming four years of how we make sure that uh, trade unions and employers are also included uh, at national level when it comes to things like the European semester. We hear all too often that instead of uh, engagement and consultation 
At best, uh, some unions are brought in for what is essentially a tick box, check box uh, exercise. So what we would like to see in that discussion is a way in which unions, when they haven't been involved in the discussion about implementation of EU policies at a national level, that they have a similar way to raise concern about that and to have a, a, a guarantee of uh, being involved in national implementation in the same way as they have a guarantee of being involved at EU level through the ETUC in those discussions. They need to have a similar guarantee at national level of being involved in the discussions and for that discussion to be meaningful um, for them. In doesn't mean that everybody's always agreed with, but it does need to be a meaningful um, engagement where the union has an opportunity to not only be heard, but also for their concerns uh, to be taken on on, on board. So um, uh, very much looking forward to the debate and the and the discussions. We, as I said, we have thirteen commitments, uh, but I don't want to go through all all, all, th all thirteen of them. But I do think there the, is a valuable. Uh, role for uh, Ireland to play in promoting enough fiscal space uh, for the uh, investments for a green transition mm -hmm. uh, to fully support uh, sector agreements because we know how how well they've worked for us in projecting in protecting terms and conditions uh, of of employment and then finally to make sure that all of our money works harder for all of us by having those social conditionalities attached to to the investments exactly exactly like they, they're doing now in the us thank you alex mm -hmm.